picking up right where we left off. Uh, we're going to discuss uh, titrations, acid-base titrations and indicators. And you've already done this in Chem 109, if you recall. I know some of you maybe did this virtually. Some of you actually did it in person. Um, but if you recall, in a titration, we are trying to find the equivalence point. And that equivalence point is when we have the same amounts or the stoichiometric equivalent of H plus and OH minus, okay? So for example, suppose we had, um, so I'll say suppose we had one molar H plus and maybe 10 milliliters of that, okay? So for that simple example, um, if I wanted to have stoichiometric equivalence, I would have to add, so we'll say plus one molar hydroxide and 10 milliliters, right? Because those two volumes and concentrations would give us the same number of moles of H plus and the same number of moles of OH minus. We do a titration often because we might not know the concentration of our base or acid, for example. So suppose we were starting with an acid. So here I'll say start with acid. And perhaps that was an unknown acid concentration. Well, that means that um, if you recall, my acid would be in this little um, Erlenmeyer flask, okay? And my base would be in the burette, right? That has the little stopcock valve and if you recall you dripped that solution in okay so if we were starting with acid then we recognize at zero volume of naoh added we would have a really acidic ph right because we're starting with acid and as we drip that hydroxide in the ph will increase steadily um, and then will ramp up exponentially in the vicinity of the equivalence point, okay? And for strong acid, strong base, that equivalence point will be pH 7.0 because we're making ordinary water, right? So once we've achieved stoichiometric equivalence of those two, we have a neutral solution. So if we were to continue to add base once we've passed the equivalence point, that pH would then continue to shoot up like a rocket um, and then eventually flatten out when we now just have all based. So at this point, it's all acid. At the equivalence point, it's neutralized. And at this point, it's all base or mostly base, right? On the other hand, we could flip this and we could put base in our flask and acid in our burette and we would just see a mirror image of the same thing. We would be starting at some basic pH, right? Um, and then we would see uh, like this mirror image profile to the equivalence point right at pH 7.0. Um, and then we would see that really drop down into the acidic pHs once we've titrated out all of our base, okay? So know what these curves look like they are very sharp looking functions, and that's how we know it's a strong acid, strong base, or strong base, strong acid. We also know because we see this middle equivalence point right here occurring right at pH 7.0. Now, if we didn't have a pH meter, um, you know, some electronic probe that can tell us exactly what the pH is, which eventually you all will get to use in the lab, um, we would use an indicator. And an indicator is um, a chemical that we add in a very, very small quantity to our burette, and that will undergo a color change at the end point. So the equivalence point and the end point are different. Remember, the equivalence point is where there's stoichiometric amounts of H plus and OH minus. The end point is where the indicator changes color. And in a well-designed experiment, so let's write well-designed experiment, these are the same, right? So if you knew 
what your equivalence point was going to be. Suppose you expected it to be 7.0. You would want to pick an indicator that undergoes a color change in that vicinity of 7.0. Okay. And just as an example, um, this is the popular phenolphthalein indicator. And you can see in acidic conditions, it's colorless. And in basic conditions, it turns pink. And I'm not going to get too much into the details of um, why this chemical structure changes colors. Um, but you can see here that these indicators have to have acid-base properties as well. So an indicator must also undergo proton transfer, either in the form of an acid or a proton acceptance in the form of a base. Um, and that does give them this color change. So you can see like where there's a proton attached to this oxygen and no longer attached to that oxygen. And also the bonding structure can change as a result of that acid base form. So here's a better look at a whole gamut of indicators. And some of these should be familiar to you. Check it out, your crystal violet. Um, so I think we call that methyl violet in your book, uh, right in your qual book. But right, this is your qual uh, litmus paper. And that litmus paper has been dyed with this crystal violet. And it goes through those lovely yellow, green, blue uh, color changes at around the vicinity of a pH of 0 0.5, as described in your qual manual which is pretty cool. Um, you guys played with the phenolphthalein in Chem 109. And phenolphthalein is supposed to, um, that very, very faint pink color does extend into the seven. It is very, very difficult to see. And if you recall from your Chem 109, if you added too much um, acid to your base titrant and you got that really rich pink color, Recall that was too much because um, it really, it's hard to see on this figure, but it was really that very faint pink color at a pH of 7.0. Um, you've also got methyl red in the qual lab as another um, litmus paper. So not only do we have these things as um, liquids that we can add small amounts to our solution, these types of indicators um, are also impregnated on litmus paper and when you dunk that litmus paper into your solution that's why it's able to change color because it has these indicators pretty cool